In a spot on Earth so remote, it borders the Arctic Circle, an environmental revolution is taking place. And it's powered by wind. Last year, wind power was the energy tech with the highest capacity of installations in Europe. And it's only going to grow. I'm heading to the far reaches of Scandinavia to investigate how GE engineers are helping make wind energy cheaper than fossil fuels. My first stop is Denmark, the birthplace of the modern wind energy industry. Here we go, one, two, hoisting mainsail. Yes. I'm on a fjord with Frank Bianchi, the technology project manager of LM Wind Power and an avid sailor. He's teaching me how to harness the power of the wind. Wind is such an incredible force. You know that sound, uh, the flagpole? The ringing of a flagpole. That for me, that means that there's a wind that activates my brain and I need to go out sailing. <laughs> Long before they turned to the wind energy industry, Ellen built nimble sailboats like this one. Design perfection is part of their heritage. So that knowledge from using these sails to capture the wind, to move boats, yes. did that knowledge translate to making blades? A rotor blade has a profile like the sails. So I would say it's the material knowledge, hydrodynamics and aerodynamics that has given LM wind power an advantage on how to make rotor blades. Today, Denmark is leading the way in Europe's growing embrace of wind energy. 44% of its energy is now sourced from wind, with 50% expected by 2020. So how did these quaint Danish towns become the hotbed of the wind energy industry? My tour guide through the countryside is GE engineer Rosemary Barnes, an expert in blade technology. We're heading to Askov, a Danish village where the first wind power plant was built over 100 years ago by innovative scientist Paul Lacour. So what has changed since Paul Lacour's time? When they were making the first wind turbines, they didn't know about lift. And so they thought, yeah, the more blades, the better. Then, yeah, Paul Lacour's experiments showed that actually you put fewer blades in there, you get actually more power from it, which must have been really interesting at the time. The better you are at uh, engineering wind turbines, the, the less they cost, the longer they last, and the result is cheaper energy, which means people are choosing wind more often. Rosemary's work at GE focuses on an important goal, making wind power technology so efficient and cost-effective that it competes with fossil fuels. So I'm heading to the nearby GE research facility to see how wind turbine blades of today have evolved since the time of Pool de Cour. Oh, there it is. Look at that, wow. That's massive. Look at that guy. I begin my tour at the stress test facility where this thing is the main attraction. It's like a dragon. Like a dragon's tail. It's like a dragon's tail. What are you testing? We're testing the fatigue life, simulating 20 years of wear and tear on a turbine. What's the machine called? The machine up upstairs is called an exciter. An exciter? Yeah. A fitting name, as I find this entire testing facility endlessly fascinating. From the blade production plant with Angel to the wind tunnel with Jordy, I'm learning about how this thorough testing process is important to the successful expansion of wind power. Welcome to the icebox. It is so cold. <laughs> so in sites like uh, in northern Sweden, where the, these blades are destined for, there can be up to 20% of the year when they would be shut down because of icing. So we want to get as much hot air as we can in the middle of the blade. Putting this system in means you can operate it throughout the whole winter period. The testing done here has produced innovative designs that will ensure the long life and durability of these systems in the ice cold, which is key since these blades are headed to a massive wind farm near the Arctic Circle, the new frontier for wind energy. The average temperature there is 40 degrees below freezing. The long journey north from Denmark to the upper reaches of Sweden takes almost 20 hours. They're just so massive. The scale of these things is huge. The Mark Bigden Wind Farm is the largest onshore wind farm in Europe. 
I met here by Sandra Wolcott, the site's project manager. And these are these are the three blades. These are going on this tower. Yes, exactly. And are they like a matched set? Yes, they balance the weight mm -hmm. because. Well, you can imagine that when you have all of those blades installed at the turbine, mm -hmm. you want to have it exactly balanced out. So this one set has to be kept together. These power lines are taking power from the wind turbines and bringing it somewhere. Where does it go? Well, first it goes to our major substation, where all the energy gets together from the whole wind farm. Mm -hmm. And from there, it's going to be transported to Norway through well, the inter-Nordic grid. This interconnected grid, how many countries does it link up to? mainly Sweden, Norway, Finland and East Denmark. But of course, all of those countries have also other connections to the rest of Europe. So this is part of a, a much bigger interconnected grid system across Northern Europe? Yes. Why choose this energy source instead of any other energy source? Because it's a renewable source and you can produce the energy and power your manufacturing plant while you know, not hurting the environment. Protecting the environment also protects the livelihoods of people tied to it. Not far from Mark Bigden, this reindeer farm has been in the Lundgren family for hundreds of years. Of course, I'm worried about the, the climate. We can't just sit down and think, someone else fix this. Otherwise, this way of life can't continue. We, we don't own the earth only for a loan to the next generation and the next. So we have to be nice to it. Steward it for your kids. Yeah. Who will then steward it for their kids. The innovation of renewable energy technologies, like wind farming, not only preserves these ways of life, but propels us into a clean and efficient future. <laughs>